so you define yourself as a skeptic or you're one of the uh, you join the skeptics um, camp um, how do you define that and um, what does it mean for the way you live your day-to-day -day life so skepticism means different things to different people uh, it started out actually as a philosophy of life back in ancient Greece and the skeptics the ancient skeptics thought that um, the way to, go to, a good li to live a good life was simply to suspend judgment, not to attach yourself to any opinion. Uh, that way, yeah, imagine that. If you actually can manage that, you have no political opinions, nobody, nobody's gonna be after you because you're on the right or the left or the center or whatever. Um, so they thought that this was the, 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 the way to, to have peace of mind in life. And since they also um, argued that there really is no way for human beings to know any, anything for sure, then it was a sort of interesting, coherent philosophy. Modern skepticism means something different. It is very much related with, uh, to, to the, to the uh, reactions against pseudoscience. It is very much a movement in support of, of scientific uh, you know, education. Uh, so a modern skeptic would be somebody who ideally at least, investigates uh, phenomena that are outside of the normal peer view of science, you know, UFOs, astrology, parapsychology, things like that. Um, things that scientists themselves probably won't be bothered to do. Uh, and um, with the intention to figure out if there is in fact anything behind these things. Um, I prefer to think of, of modern skeptics as you know, people who are generally open-minded about the possibility of um, paranormal or strange phenomena, but that really want to see the evidence and seriously look at uh, what the claims are and, uh, and whether they stand up to scrutiny. Usually they don't. That's the problem. So are you a modern skeptic or an ancient skeptic? I'm a modern skeptic. I, yeah, my philosophy of life is, leans more towards stoicism than, than skepticism in terms of ancient philosophies. Uh, I do think the ancient, the ancient skeptics were an interesting uh, bunch and they had a number of interesting points. They do inform modern uh, skepticism because uh, we do retain this notion that knowledge, proof is a very high standard um, that almost, it's never, almost never reached in reality. Uh, even in science, you know, when people say, oh, there's a scientific proof of something, well, usually scientists don't prove things. Mathematicians are more in the business of proving. Scientists can provide evidence, uh, but evidence can be faulty, evidence can be uh, provisional. Uh, scientific theories uh, may, may be supported up to a certain point and then abandoned. Uh, so the modern uh, view of human knowledge is, in a sense, more skeptical. That is, we, we really are aware of the, of the limitations even of science. So as a modern skeptic, um when you looked at certain um, ideas that are maybe not mainstream scientific ideas, more kind of paranormal beliefs or um, kind of reflections on those kind of uh, experiences, was there, you said most of them don't um, uh, stand up to, to scrutiny, but uh, were there any that did? Um, That's a good up? question. Um, historically, yes. Um, like it depends on how you look at things, but for instance, um, alchemy is today is considered a pseudoscience because if you if you think that you can actually turn you know lead into gold or something like that, uh, you, you're seriously mistaken. But at some point in the past, alchemy was taken seriously until a few centuries ago. Well, then it mutated in a sense into what we today call mo modern chemistry, right? So the, the, the alchemists, the successful alchemists became chemists and chemistry is certainly a science. So that kind of claim um, stood up. The alchemists actually did discover things about um, what we would today call the chemistry of elements. Uh, although their core idea was in fact mistaken. So there are examples uh, in the history of science where certain fields start out in a kind of a sketchy position and then they either evolve into pseudoscience, they, they sort of devolve I should say, or they evolve into science. I mean think about it, the other obvious example is uh, the fact that until several centuries ago there was no sharp distinction between astronomy and astrology. There is today, uh, but you know, uh, Ptolemy and, uh, 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 was just as much an astronomer as an astrologer and that went on for most of the Middle Ages. 
Uh, and then only gradually people realized that there was some good stuff to keep, and that's what we today call astronomy, and some stuff that didn't work out. And that's what we uh, think of, of astrology. Even very famous scientists um, got involved at some point or another with what we would today uh, call pseudoscience. I mean, Newton is arguably one of the most you know, famous and you know, the geniuses of, of science of all time. Uh, turns out he spent more time studying alchemy and doing biblical criticism of all things than physics. But we remi remember him today as a physicist because the physics part worked and the alchemy and biblical criticism didn't work. So, um, Are there any contemporary examples from contemporary science that um, you think is more pseudoscience or is slightly problematic? There's a number of areas of modern science that are problematic, but that's the nature of science, I think. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, SETI. Um, you know, it's done by scientists, it's done by using very expensive instrumentation, you know, radio telescopes usually. Um, it's definitely not a pseudoscience, but it's not quite science, is it? We, don't have, we have no data at all. Uh, you know, we, we haven't found a single uh, case so far, so the sample size is n equals zero. Um, the theory is a little bit shaky and optimistic. And basically, he said the researchers simply assume that there are beings out there that have a similar psychology to our own and want to communicate with us. Um, so it's it's a little bit, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider it a mainstream science. It's kind of one of those borderline cases. Evolutionary psychology is another one. Um, so the notion that human behavior evolved is pretty sound. That's part of standard evolutionary biology. But when you try to apply directly evolutionary theory to modern human behaviors, uh, such as gender differences, for instance, then that becomes much more problematic because it's difficult to do the appropriate tests. It's, the, 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 the data are difficult to gather. Uh, it's easy to speculate and to come up with hypotheses that, however, are not necessarily standing up to scrutiny. So evolutionary psychology is another one of those things that is right in between. And depending on future development over the next decade or, or so, uh, we may talk about it as an established science down the line or as something that actually devolved into uh, pseudoscience. In less recent uh, but not too distant past, things like eugenics or phrenology, both of those were considered scientific. Uh, when uh, they had their heyday, and uh, then eventually, you know, both of them were sort of dismissed uh, as not working, and uh, from a scientific perspective, and then if people insist in in pushing them, then that's when the, the word pseudoscience comes up. Pseudoscience doesn't refer to something that is wrong, to an idea that is wrong, because there's plenty of ideas in science that turn out to be wrong. Like what? Uh, oh, like every theory in physics before the current one. And probably the current one is, is also at least incomplete, so in some sense it's wrong. Uh, by current one, I mean quantum mechanics, which at the moment is the most established scientific idea of all times, but physicists already know that it's incomplete. So that's why they're searching for the next uh, iteration. So the, the, the difference between science and pseudoscience doesn't lie in the fact that one is right and the other one is wrong. That's actually a common misconception, both in the public in general and sometimes even among skeptics. Uh, the real difference is in the methods, and the real difference is in the fact that once you, are, you, you, you get a negative result, you accept it. And you say, well, okay, that didn't work, so we're going to set it aside. If there are negative results showing very clearly and consistently that an idea didn't work, and yet the proponents of that idea c insist uh, that it is a good one, that's when they begin to slide into pseudoscience. Uh, I mean, pseudoscientists, they don't use that term, but pseudoscientists have the same trappings of science. They publish journals, they have conferences, uh, you know, they look at empirical evidence, sometimes they do statistical analysis. So from the outside, to a person who doesn't know better, they, it looks like they're doing science. Um, but if you're doing that kind of things with a notion that it's been clearly discredited, uh, then that to me is the, arguably the best definition of pseudoscience. So how far, as a skeptic, modern skeptic, how far um, can you actually embrace the idea that, okay, we have not knowledge of, for instance, quant that this is the way quantum mechanics work? Or, like, or do you always kind of have a kind of critical yeah, sure. um, doubt, sure. you know, that maybe it might, yeah. it might not yeah. exactly be that way? Yeah, if you're a good scientist, you should always have a critical 
bit um, in mind, you know, a critical little thing in the back of your mind, even with well-established scientific theories. I mean, philosophers of science um, have come up with this notion called the um, pessimistic meta-induction, uh, which sounds really complicated, but in fact, it's a simple idea. Inductive reasoning is a type of reasoning that we do all the time. It's when you generalize from certain instances that you know of to a more general situation, right? So, so if I, a statistical sampling is based on induction, for instance. If I want to know the average height of the population in a town, I'm not going to measure every single inhabitant. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sample. And then I generalize from that sample. That's induction. Now, if you do that with the history of science, it turns out that uh, every single scientific theory that has been proposed up to this point turned out to be wrong. So if you apply induction, uh, you will conclude that even current scientific theories will turn out eventually to be wrong. It's called a pessimistic induction because it basically leads you to believe that science, uh, it's always wrong. But there are degrees of wrongness, right? So um, Newtonian mechanics is more wrong than general relativity. General relativity also is wrong or incomplete um, because there are certain things that just don't work out very well within the theory. So we know, science, uh, physicists know this, and they're looking again for the next iteration just like they're, they are for quantum mechanics. But to say that, to simply stop it, say that both general relativity and, and uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics are wrong, it's not quite the full story. Because wrong doesn't come into only two categories. There, there's a degrees of wrongness. Okay, so the pseudoscience is the most wrong, and then kind of general relativity and quantum mechanics are slightly less wrong than that. They're, they're a lot more than slightly a less wrong. More, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it, the, the, the general notion is correct. There is a continuum. Right, so uh, at one extreme, you have things like astrology or alchemy or things like that, things that we know by now uh, are uh, incorrect notions. There are still people who believe them. That's, that's a different issue. Uh, but pretty much we've figured it out, that out. It, I would be stunned if it turned out that all of a sudden astrology, in fact, turned out to be correct. Uh, we have plenty of empirical evidence and plenty of very good theoretical reasons to think that astrology is not working. So that's one extreme. At the opposite extreme, you have very, very well-established scientific theories, such as quantum mechanics, general relativity, uh, the theory of evolution in biology. Now, those also are at least incomplete, which means that technically they're wrong, uh, but, but they're really the opposite extreme of that continuum. And then in the middle, there is all the, these other stuff that it's difficult to tell, such as uh, fields like parapsychology or evolutionary psychology or SETI. Some of these are a little bit more on the scientific side of, of the divide, some of, uh, of them are more on the pseudoscientific, but it's like the jury is still out. I wouldn't, for instance, you know, I would bet much more money against astrology than against parapsychology. I would still bet a significant amount of money against parapsychology, but not as much as I'm, you know, so, so if you think of the amount of money that you're willing to, to bet as the degree of confidence that you have that something is either going to work or not going to work, then I would put a lot of money on, on the validity of quantum mechanics and a lot of money on the invalidity of, of astrology. But if you're picking something in between, I'm going to keep my money and see what happens. <laughs> OK, moving on to um, Stoicism. Um, how um, did you turn towards this um, uh, philosophy as a kind of philosophy for life? Midlife crisis, <laughs> um, you know, which I'm told pretty much everybody goes through at some point or another. Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a period in life where things were, were going not too well personally and, and um, even from the point of view of, of uh, uh, my profession, it, it, it seemed like I had hit a little bit of a quiet zone where, yeah, I was doing my job and it was doing fine, but it wasn't anything that was particularly novel or exciting or something like that. So th those are the period in life where you sort of, if you can afford it, you can stop and, and think about stuff and say, hmm, where am I going to go from there? Now, since I was beginning to study philosophy professionally, because at the, up, at the, up, up until that time, I was actually a professional biologist. I switched to philosophy at, at about that time. Uh, once you start studying philosophy uh, at the graduate level, uh, in, that, in my case, but even, I think, at, at pretty much any level, you can't avoid start thinking about sort of the big picture. And, and say, you, know, you, you read Plato, for instance. Or, or, or you read a book on ethics or something, and you say, oh, well, that's interesting, where, where do I fit in with this? So that kind of started a, a quest uh, to explore different 
possible options, and I looked at in a number of possible philosophies of life. The philosophy of life, by the way, is nothing mysterious. It's just a combination of two things, a metaphysics and an ethics. A metaphysics is a base, essentially an account of how the world works, uh, and an ethics is an account of how you should behave in the world. If you define it that way, then every religion is also a philosophy of life. Right? So I, I grew up Catholic, for instance, and you know, Catholicism is, gives you a metaphysics. It tells you that the world was originated by a god and that the god de de decides what goes on in the world. That's a metaphysics. And then it tells you, uh, you know, an ethics. It tells you you go to church uh, uh, on Sundays because you want to learn how to be, be a better person. Right? So those two characteristics are, are common between, uh, you know, among all religions and philosophies of life. So I looked at a number of them, explored them, including Buddhism, uh, including a, uh, two or three different ancient Greek Roman philosophies. And I was in the middle of this thing, and then one day on Twitter, of all places, I saw this thing that said, uh, help us celebrate Stoic Week. And I said, what the hell is Stoic Week, and why would anyone want to celebrate it? Uh, I remember the Stoics from, from high school, but I didn't really remember much about them, other than they're supposed to suppress emotions and go through life with a stiff upper lip which turned out not to be true. Those are both stereotypes, but hey, that's what I remember. Um, but I, I was curious, so I signed up. Uh, it turns out that Stoic Week is an annual event, uh, which happens every fall, is organized by an international group of scholars, um, philosophers, historians, and uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapists, because it turns out that Stoicism has uh, actually uh, has influenced the development of uh, CBT in the 1950s and 60s. So there are certain kinds of psychotherapy that actually originated at least uh, with uh, inspiration from the, the, from the Stoics. So I did it for a week. It really clicked. It's in like, I, I started reading the, the Stoics and I started practicing you know, their meditations and their exercises and it really clicked. So I committed for another couple of months until the end of the year and then I committed for another year. And then here we are five years later, I wrote two books about it. Um, and I still do it. What's one of your um, dearest um, kind of rules or idea or stoic ideas that um, have really helped you? The fundamental one that has made a major difference in my life and it, it, it does affect uh, the life of, of pretty much anybody who practices stoicism is something called the dichotomy of control. Um, the stoics believe that everything you do can be partitioned into two components, one part that is really up to you where you really have control, and another part that you that it's not up to you, where you don't have control because or complete control because the outcome depends on on external factors. And a fundamental tenet of Stoic philosophy is that you should focus all your energy on the part that is under your control, and then develop an attitude of equanimity toward the second component. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. But it's not a reflection of who you are. It's a reflection of the fact that the universe works in you know strange ways. So let me give you a specific example. Let's say that, that tomorrow you're up for uh, a job interview and you know, the normal thing to do would be to, to be anxious and say, you know, I really want this job and I, I'm really going to hope uh, that I get it and so on. That's normal. The stoic would approach in this way. It's like, well, tomorrow I have a job interview. Did I do everything that is in my power up to this point to prepare for the interview? Yes. Am I focused for the, at the beginning of the interview? Yes. Um, do I know what I'm talking about? Yes. That's it. Done. Um, then how the interview goes, it's not really up to you. It depends on your competition. It depends on who the interviewer is, and, you know, whether, whether, whether he got up in the morning and on a, on, a, on, a, on a strange mood or whatever. And the fact that, that even if you get the job, you shouldn't, according to the Stoics, you shouldn't feel too cocky because part of it is a result of your efforts, but part of it is that you just got lucky. And similarly, however, if you fail, if you don't get the interview, you shouldn't beat yourself up because, again, it's not under your control. You, you did, if you did everything you could, um, that's, that's all, that's all the, that it's under your control. So that really does help. Uh, I think that essentially, it, it, in modern terms, is, um, the, the, the basic notion is to internalize your goals. Right? So I just mentioned the job interview. Uh, uh, let's say that you know a common thought is if you're in a relationship, oh, I hope she loves me. Mm, no, uh, I hope to be a loving person because that's under your control. Whether she loves you back, it's up to her. Um, I, oh, I hope that this friend is gonna you know really be a good friend. Well, you can be a good friend. That's under under your control. Whether other people are gonna be good friends to you or not, it's not. 
and so on and so forth. So you can apply it pretty much everywhere. And once you start practicing that way and think, lo looking at things that way, uh, you just calm down because you say, well, I'm going to accept whatever happens so long as I know that I've done the best that I could. Two final questions. So does that mean that basically you have or a continuous dialogue in your head. So one voice is the kind of anxious, irrational voice saying, oh my God, but I really yeah. want this interview. And then the stoic within you says, you've done everything you could. Right. Is that what happens that's in, in, much in it. the stoic's that, brain? That's, that's <laughs> right. And in fact, that's also a technique that is used in, in kind of behavioral therapy uh, to challenge your own thoughts, ch challenge your own perceptions. Epictetus was one of the major stoic philosophers uh, from the second century. And he has this beautiful way of, of uh, expressing these thoughts. He said that we should look at our impressions. An impression in Stoic terminology is your initial opinion about something. Uh, so for instance, that, oh my gosh, I have the interview and this is stressful. This is a stressful situation. That's an, that's an opinion. That, that's expressing an opinion. Well, who is expressing the opinion? The interview is just a fact of life. It's not, the interview doesn't come with opinions. You are expressing that opinion. And so you can challenge yourself and say, wait a minute. Why am I thinking this way? Why, why, why not try to think about things in a, in a different way? And that actually does work. There is pretty good empirical evidence that, it, you know, it's not a silver bullet. So it's not like you start doing this tonight and then all of a sudden your life is fine. Um, but if you do it on a regular basis, you learn to challenge your own impressions, your own opinion, your own judgments. Then little by little, uh, you, it will become easier and easier. And at some point, you'll stop having those kind of uh, distressing. Uh, that's where the stereotype of the lack of emotion comes from. It's not a question of, of suppressing emotions. It's, it's a question of controlling and interacting with your negative thoughts. Great. I was going to ask you as a final question about whether there is um, a Stoic philosopher that you um, hold particularly dear. Um, yeah, I just mentioned it. But, you, but you've just talked about Epictetus, so I think we're, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, we're, uh, we're you know, happy he, with he that. Was, Unless um, you want to mention someone else as well. No, or, or I, I say think Epictetus is good. <laughs> yeah. Epictetus is good. I mean, the, the, the guy had, uh, was an incredible person. He started out his life as a slave, uh, and then he was freed. Um, started st studying Stoic philosophy, became the most famous uh, philosopher and uh, teacher in, uh, in second century Rome. He had an incredible sense of humor um, and he had, he was blunt with his students, he just told the thing as he, as he saw it. So one, for instance, one of my favorite quotes um, from Epictetus says, um, so I have to die. Well, one of these days I'll have to die. Apparently this is not the day, but now I'm hungry. So I'm going to go and take lunch because that's under my control. And then when death comes, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it at that point. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.